back. I'm glad to be back too with you live from Peyton Hall. And here we are getting in the mood of doing astronomy. And what's better than to consider what's up above in the sky right now. And as we look straight up about nine or 10 o'clock tonight, what do we see? Lo and behold, the Big Dipper, kind of surprising to see it in this position. And below the Big Dipper on the star chart, you see a number of red marks and red print. It's a little too fine to see, I realize, but what you've got going is the great wall of galaxies in the Virgo constellation, as well as in Leo and Canis Venetici, some really spectacular galaxies available to our eyes and our telescopes this time of year. And I'll just repeat the mantra, you're all welcome to come out to the club's observatory at Washington Crossing State Park, where we have some really excellent telescopes and some astro video camera technology going, public nights and member nights, Friday nights, anytime it's clear enough. And these are the kinds of things you might see if you took the time to do a little EAA with the club's cameras on the C-14. These are a little bit longer exposures, but I'm telling you, you can see these in real time on the monitor with the live astro cams we're running out at Washington Crossing. And I urge you to get out there if you haven't. Some of the really wonderful galaxies that are coming up this time of year, Messier object 63 on the left and the famous pair in Leo 65 and 66. So very much visible with the technology we have out there. Another observing event coming up very soon here, and this was brought to my attention by Bill and Dave and I think Tom, and the idea is that there's a unusual occultation of Jupiter by the moon on, uh, you know, I can't see the title of my slide when I'm showing it to you, isn't that funny? Somebody read me the date there, May 17th. May 17th. Thank you. Uh, it's going to be in the morning, and you see the time, 7.39, uh, our local time, and the, mo the moon will occult Jupiter, and a simulation looks like this right at the moment. This is Jupiter hanging out over to the left side, just getting ready to go under. And if you time it a little sooner, you'll get to watch the blinking out of Callisto and Ganymede the moons of Jupiter, which will be uh, occulted first. So get up early in the morning next Wednesday. If it's clear, partly clear, train your binox or your scope, the southeast sky and see an unusual event, the disappearance of Jupiter in the daylight sky. It's a trick to do it. Unless you have a go-to mount, you're gonna have to work a little bit with your, your sky chart. Uh, we can talk about this a little bit more after the break, whether there's something going on at the observatory. I do not know, it's a possibility, I guess. Uh, the other big thing that happened locally, and we were buzzing about this at dinner tonight, I'm sure you've all heard of this, because I think this is all over the national, probably it's being broadcast in France. Uh, a meteorite struck a house in Hopewell Township, but more to the point, the, the place, the house where this meteorite struck is less than a half a mile from our club observatory. I mean, really, it was aiming for us. I think that's pretty clear. <laughs> So, you know, I'm not enough of an expert to tell from pictures. Maybe some of you have. This is a chondrite of some type. It appears to have some iron content. They didn't comment in the news article, which sadly was a little more focused on forensics than it was on science. But if there's enough iron in there to uh, show an effect with a magnet is a, an open question. So maybe keep your ears tuned. Maybe there's more pieces of this out there. And when you go out to Washington Crossing, you know, just keep an eye out for this kind of a rock. Uh, it's interesting, these pictures on the right, it went through the guy's roof, went through the ceiling and landed on the floor and put that dent in his floorboards. So the roof was able to break the velocity enough. And uh, I gather he was only maybe 10 feet away from it when, when it happened. So one, and Siri calculated it for me tonight, the chances of this happening to you, to him, to her, one in two times 10 to the 12th chances. So go figure. I don't know. I think that's enough of a preamble. I think we got to get on to the main event. So, Victor, I'm going to ask you to come up. Our guest speaker tonight is uh, going to talk about the hunt for near-Earth asteroids. Uh, a few decades ago, uh, Comet Shoot Maker Levy 9 sort of increased public awareness of near-Earth asteroids and the dangers they may pose. Uh, astronomers believe that with enough lead time, perhaps measured in decades or centuries, potentially catastrophic impacts could be avoided by nudging dangerous objects away from Earth's intersecting trajectories. At the dawn of the space age, 20 near-Earth asteroids were known. In 1980, the number reached 50. 
In 2000, we reached 1,000 known near-Earth asteroids. In 2022, we passed the 3,000 mark and we're still counting. Our guest speaker tonight will describe his own experience of how this revolution occurred and why discovering more and smaller near-Earth asteroids is important. Um, Elaine Maury started as an amateur astronomer. His first, the first asteroid he observed with his three-inch telescope convinced him that asteroids were the most boring things in the sky. I gather that's changed since then. Um, he discovered his first near-Earth asteroid in 1983 and has followed the field ever since. He has worked in several observatories. Um, in 2003, he left the professional world to open a touristic observatory and lead tours uh, in Chile's Atacama Desert. His organization is Space, San Pedro de Atacama Celestial Explorations, I always have one thing I cannot pronounce, receives about 15,000 tourists per year who discover the beauty of the universe through several large telescopes. The largest has an aperture of 45 inches. This activity allows him to finance his own research with a group of friends. The MAP project, okay, is the fourth most successful asteroid search program in the world after the three largest NASA finance programs. Um, he has a, a blog, which you can uh, link to for more details. And thank you to Gene Allen for bringing you on board. And I have to pin this on you without giving too much thought to the position because mm. that would be more than whatever. Yeah. Okay. Does it? Okay. Good enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, well, introduction. Now at the end, at the end. So yes, as you, as you said, I started as an amateur astronomer, and I went back to amateur astronomy in a way. Uh, just to get an idea, can you raise your hand, people who own a telescope here? Yeah, what? more than one both hands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, good. Okay, so yeah, nearest objects, you know, uh, brief history, well, things you know, okay. Uh, we started to understand, you know, the Earth was a planet, for example, around 1600. And we've always worked in both ways in science. I mean, first you observe, you have better instruments, you see new things, and so on and so on. And then on the other hand, you make calculations, and so on and so on. Uh, people realized very quickly that there was a big hole. And of course, an Italian who was not invited <laughs> discovered the first asteroid. And since then, we discovered more and more and more, first visually and that must have been, well, interesting times, you know, go outside, look through a big refractor and plot some stars and come the following day, see something that moved and so on and so on. Because, you know, when you found one, yeah, I think you were quite happy. Uh, then by photography and then in the recent years by people and animals, you must all know that, I assume. Uh, the antiquity, okay, uh, you will see that I'm a lazy guy and some of the drawings I didn't translate from French, but uh, number is like number, uh, cumulé is accumulated, or something like that, asterisk and so on. But you can see, of course, a few things that this is a guy at scale. Uh, uh, is there like a laser or something? Or not? Uh, the only thing you have is on the spray, on the, the there thing? pointer there, yeah. There you go. Or oh, maybe I can move. Uh, if I move the cursor, yeah, you see the cursor? No, no, oh, wow. no that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll use that thing. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, first discoveries. There was a strange moment where like nobody else looked for them and no more discoveries. Mm -hmm. That found four, you know, like, you know, happy. And then after that, we start to discover. And of course, it's a logarithmic scale, so it doesn't should be more like, like this. Um, you can see a few things like here. 
And there were a few people from Holland. One of them was Tom Gerhardt, who was working at the University of Arizona. And they made a survey with uh, Palomar Schmidt. And so you know, that's this bug here. And of course, this is clearly when we started to have digital detectors. And then, of course, it goes down flat because, uh, well, it's exponential. So 3,000 asteroids per year is nothing on that scale. Uh, this one is you know, interesting for other reasons. Uh, you see that, like, you know, this uh, gap where there is very almost no discoveries. They used to have like five asteroids per year, up to 10, and so on. Uh, one of the weird, and we have been with uh, like here, you see, this is the First World War. This is the second one. Okay, no more observations. Uh, this is the Palomar survey, the Palomar Leiden survey. And uh, that you see is like quite irregular, but at the time they found like almost nothing. I mean, I would have, well, it makes sense also because it was very hard to find. <laughs> then, uh, 50s, 60s. So, well, you may recognize this. Person, Zwicky, Zwicky, right? yeah. Uh, the Palomar 88. Most of the discoveries were made uh, there at the time of this near Earth. Because uh, one of the problems was like it was a lot of work to find an asteroid. Uh, discovering asteroids on the on the photographic plate can be done. Measuring it was a very lengthy process. I will show you more slides about this. And then you have 3,000 asteroids, you have one, you have two, who cares, okay? Uh, plus at the time, really, the, the, we started to have like a, a lot of the astrophysics done in galaxies and stuff, which were you know, much more interesting than, than asteroids. So you see in 30 years, only 500 asteroids were discovered. And of course, they got the famous name of Guardians of the Sky. Um, and of course, this stayed on. Okay, a little bit. The idea is that uh, when they discovered the first transneptunian asteroids, which are clearly asteroids, uh, they are not called asteroids because if you go to a time allocation committee and you say, I want to add like uh, your four meter telescope to discover asteroids, they will tell you, oh, yeah, too bad. Okay, so the transneptunian objects, we talk about transneptunian objects, even though they are asteroids, because like asteroids have quite a bad reputation. Uh, you know, the, that's the way it was done in the 1780. So we, we had photographic Schmidt telescopes on astrographs as well. Um, the idea is that if you make a long enough exposure trail, I mean, following the stars, the asteroid will make a small trail, except if you have a small trail, you don't know in which direction the thing is going. Okay. You can have a, an asteroid that looks really like a main belt, but if it goes the wrong way, clearly it's you know, closer to us. Uh, so very often people were making, uh, you know, like 20 minutes of exposure, then you close the shutter for five, then reopen for five, and then you have like the, the asteroid would be like a small trail with a small dot, and it uh, was telling you it was going this way. Okay. Uh, the detection was just like you look with, uh, with a hand magnifier and a pencil and you know, show your, your asteroid. Uh, here, this is the setup that was used in the Nice Observatory, and you can see it was very modern. There was a computer. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, size machines were like very high precision machine where you can basically measure to a tenth of a micron uh, where the stars was. You, in fact, you were moving. The thing was, this, you know, it's like, well, like a parallelogram, and you, you know, measure, and you know, I will explain. Here, what we were doing. Uh, the reference uh, catalog was the SAO catalog, which uh, that thing, uh, about three, you know, 260,000 stars. On average, not a good quality. <laughs> it's, a comp it's a compilation of the, you know, all kinds of measurements done, including in the 19th century and so on. Uh, this catalog was done mainly, you know, when we started to have satellites and we needed to calculate the orbits of satellites and so on. Uh, what you would do is uh, you would use the Palomar Sky Survey prints. Uh, the uh, University of Ohio had made the like some overlays and you would find your asteroid and you would find the nearest SAO stars 
and then you write down, and then you would go on the uh, book and say, uh, stars, blah, 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 blah. Okay, uh, RA is, da, 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 da. you would write down the, 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 the coordinates. And then, uh, in fact, in France in 1980, we, we had uh, one of the, these pocket calculators, and you would enter all, all the numbers. Of course, very often you would make some mistakes, and you would have to re-enter the thing, and so on and so on. Uh, so it was really a painful uh, thing, and we would only measure the very interesting asteroids. On a, like a one meter Schmidt telescope, if you took a plate on the ecliptic, you would have like hundreds of asteroids, not hundreds, but like about 100 asteroids, and you could not measure them. You would just measure the, the very interesting one, those who are, I mean, most of the asteroids would go in the same direction. If you find something going this way or that way, or the trail is very long, that was the nearest asteroid, and then you would follow it. Okay. But, uh, you know, today is quite different, I will show you. Uh, you may have heard of these people. Uh, Blow, I mean, she was, you know, her, Eleanor Hedy, uh, who died like about 10 years ago, I mean, the, the shoemakers. They, they had like each one week of observing on the 18 inch at Palomar. Um, they hated each other. <laughs> uh, I knew both of them, they were good, good friends, but no, <laughs> too much competition. You know? uh, and uh, at the time, of course, uh, they would take the films and one week of observing and they would survey some of it, and then all the measurements would be done during the other three weeks. Um, because, of course, uh, detecting is one thing, measuring is a very important thing you have to do. Uh, you see that at the time, the number of NEOs discovered was like one, 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 two, three. Uh, they were about, in 1970, they were about 23, 25 years. Most of them had been discovered just by chance. I mean, people doing pictures of a galaxy, and then there was a streak, and they would follow it, and so on and so on. Uh, there was no dedicated program. But, you know, as I told you, it was very, very hard at the time to measure because uh, it would take a lot of graphic plate with your eyes. Uh, you, you go back at, the, at your house, the eyes are like this, you know. It, it was a difficult time. Uh, this person, this is the, the only picture I found of him, Jim Gibson, I, I used to observe with him. He had a couple of full moon nights uh, at Palomar and would go after a very faint object to recover them and you know, uh, improve the orbits and so on and so on. But of course, one of the problems with the first CCDs, they were about that big, you know, like my fingernail, and you never had any reference stars in your field. And so same thing, it would take like two, three days of data, then would go back, you know, with tapes, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe five megabytes or something like this. Uh, and then he would do, uh, you know, you remember the overlay, uh, he would trace his CCD field, he would uh, reduce all the stars using the SAO stars around, and then he would have like a sub catalog, and from then he would deduce, so it was like, you know, that was 1980, and it was, it was still very, very hard to do some uh, uh, correct astrometry. Uh, at least you would measure only the very interesting things. Uh, then we start to get in the modern times, we start to have computers, we start to have, well, large, you know, four megapixels by, you know, today is like not really large, but uh, at the time it was, uh, the first uh, software written, and mainly, of course, the guide star catalog, and you started to be able to automatize the, the data reduction. In fact, you started to be able to, well, real time. Uh, in France, we had a system like that, again, with a four megapixel uh, camera. And for us, the real time was you had finished the reduction of the night at six o'clock the following day, so that you could reobserve the, the, the following night. It was not really real time, real time. But at the time, of course, the computers were relatively slow. Uh, one of the weird things, and one of the things that I explained during my tours, is that we have basically three periods in astronomy uh, from the antiquity to 1609, 1609 Galileo, okay, 1609, 1980, 1990. 
we had telescopes, we had no ways of using data. Basically measuring a photographic plate, they were like PDS machines and it would take like two days to scan a machine. And you know, the, w when I started to work at Miss Observatory, uh, I was like very, very proud because they gave me a hard disk, you know. The hard disk was a thing like this, five megabytes, you would like shrink, put it in the machine. That was like five megabytes. I will <laughs> never fill this out, you know. And so that was like 30 years ago. And, and indeed, in the last 30 years, as you know, astronomy has changed completely. Uh, in six years, you know, 1992, we discovered the first Constantinian asteroid. Uh, 1995, the first exoplanet. 1998, the acceleration of the universe, I think the expansion of the universe. I mean, in six years, you know, all the books have to be rewritten and so on and so on. And of course, today we can deal with a lot of data that was completely uh, unthinkable uh, before. So here are the, 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 the digital age pioneers, uh, Tom Gerrels. Um, you know, I, I met him several times. There is, he wrote a book called On the Glassy Sea, and if you can find it, read it. The guy had a life. Uh, he started like, as a kid, as a spy for the British. Uh, he was going through the lines of uh, the, 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 the Nazi to spy and so on, because he was a kid, nobody would take care, you know, would pay attention to a kid. Uh, after that, he was in his 20s, he fought in the jungle of Indonesia. Uh, then, I mean, you read the, the, the life of you, you feel like, wow, it was quite a guy. And so he was the first one to understand the, uh, you had to start uh, looking for asteroids with, uh, with a CCD camera. Uh, this person is Jim Scotty. He was the first one who wrote, you know, the, the embryo of all the software that most surveys use today. Uh, the idea uh, is that you do like a series of fields, like 10 fields, so you would photograph this, 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 and when you are done, you do it again, do, 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 do. then you do it again. So each field you have to taken three times with like 20 minutes of interval. Uh, you have like a source extractor program, which will find you, a, make you a list of all the, the objects on the, on the image. And then you compare the three, oh, there is enough set you take into account and so on and so on. Um, but then there are the fixed objects, which are the stars, the galaxies, and, and that's it. Uh, and then for the ones which appear only once, you find some other object in the second catalog around, and you see if when you have one, two, you find the third one, and if there is one, then that's an asteroid, okay? Uh, basically, Panstar, uh, Catalina, uh, all the other programs use this type of technique today with you know, improvements and so on, but the, the overall thing is there, okay? And of course, once you started to automatize, there was big changes because now we started to measure all the main belts which we, we had never me measured before. We are now the 30,000 of the year, so uh, told you we started like at 20-something in 1970, in uh, 1992, I remember there was a meeting and uh, we circulated a catalog of 200 nearest objects and we were like, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, now we find about 3,000 per year. So there is, you know, a big... So the, this one interesting is from the JPL site. Uh, you see like one program works and is a you know, big key for a while and then it decreases and so on and so on. And you see some other programs starting and so on and so on. Uh, but today, yeah, the last few years, we have discovered more than 3,000 NEOs per, per year. Um, in fact, this uh, is from, uh, you know, completely you know, fresh from yesterday. So the, the main programs are the Catalina Sky Survey. They used, uh, well, actually three telescopes, but I didn't find a photo of the third telescope. Uh, one is a Schmidt telescope, uh, which shows, well, it's like 70 centimeter. Uh, again, talking with my, uh, you know, that the typical Schmidt has a smaller lens than the mirror so that the light arrives and there is a uniform field of view, but in CCD, you don't care, you just make a flat field correction. And so you can 
still use the same mirror, but you put a bigger lens. So they had a lot of uh, improvement done on this Schmidt telescope, and it still finds quite a lot of objects. And then this telescope is uh, uh, like F3 or something, and there is a camera at the prime focus. Uh, very simple mount, but very, very efficient. Uh, same thing, they used to have like four megapixel cameras and so on. Now they have like 110 megabytes, 110 megapixel camera uh, on both telescopes, in fact. And uh, I will explain a bit more about this. Uh, then uh, you have the PanStar. Uh, PanStar, so is a, at first, is mostly based on cosmology and so on, and they realized that if they're said that they were going to save the world by protecting uh, us from the asteroids and so on, then they, get finance, they, they, they got financed by NASA and the US Air Force. They wanted to build four telescopes, but only two were built, and they have like a very big, uh, very big camera. Uh, but then it's, you know, there is a strange thing about this. Uh, of course, they do a lot of pictures with filters, and that kills the detection. It's good for cosmology. It's not good for, for, for asteroid research. Uh, you have a, one of the things is that their, their chips are not perfect, perfect. You know, the green part is like where basically they don't do any uh, detection. That's about the field of view compared to the moon. So some illustration that I found on the web. Now, one of the weird things, as if you discover asteroids, very often you say, wow, I found it, it was just on the edge of the field. And uh, there is a very simple geometrical reason, which is like uh, this outside part has the same superficie as here. So you have 50% of chance of finding an asteroid on the edge than in the center. And of course, you don't want to have too many edges. And so the matrix, the CCDs uh, matrix, where you have like, uh, chips and chips and chips, you have a small inter, in, uh, inter you say that interstice, small space anyway. Uh, and of course the asteroid is moving and if in one or of the, of the detection it's inside the hole, it's never seen. And so they miss quite a lot of things. In fact, when you observe, you basically use a, a sieve uh, first because you don't see anything around the bright stars, okay? then you may have cosmetic problem with the telescope and then whenever your camera is like with a lot of chips you also lose quite a lot so it's a lot better if you have a monolithic chip and you know that's what i was uh, that's written here you can read as well uh, if you make the calculation okay normally the pan star telescope is like 10 times better than the catalina schmidt in practice it only finds twice as much asteroids in theory it should find 10 times more but losing things okay uh yeah well, first first things first of course we started to discover because they are the brightest to find the, the biggest uh, asteroids uh, the the last uh, dinosaur killer you know uh, uh, very often when, when you have an article about an uh, asteroid hitting the earth blah 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 they talk to you about the dinosaurs that problem has been solved 20 years ago get over it, we will not die like the dinosaurs and so on. Uh, Putin is much more, much more dangerous than, uh, you know, you have to have a sense of proportion, okay? Another thing you can do if you Google asteroid impact and you look at the images, most of the images are like this Pluto-sized object falling on the earth, you know, it's completely crazy. I mean, there is a lot of hype about it. It's, I mean, I will talk some more about this. Uh, you see that uh, on the left there, that's uh, what you get when you go to the minorplanetcenter.net uh, site. Uh, keep the things in, keep the track of the discoveries in real time. Uh, so now we have like more than 30, we are approaching 32,000. So by the end of this year, we'll be at 35,000 in EO discovered. Uh, it's really going full swing, but most of the things we, fall, we find are very, very small objects, which really do not present any, any risk. Uh, if you have a two meter asteroid, you'll have like uh, meteorites. Uh, it can destroy your wooden floor. Uh, in fact, even the, you know, the Chelyabinsk one, which was a 20 meter, didn't kill anybody. Okay? 
And if you compare it, I mean, I made a rough calculation, you know, how many times do you cut yourself with glass? Once every two, three, four, five years, I don't know, maybe never. Okay, but if you compare it with eight billions of people every day, there are many, many, many more people who are uh, cut with glass than that day on Chernobyl. And the people who died in Chernobyl died because of cancer, a uh, heart attack, you know, the normal thing. The asteroid didn't do anything. Okay, it's, it's very important to put things in relation with uh, the rest of the numbers. Anyway, you see that uh, in, nine, in 2000, we, we discovered up to 80 uh, one kilometer or bigger asteroids. These days, when we have two or three per year, uh, it's like a, a good year, <laughs> okay? But uh, so we are approaching, I mean, the, the, the very big one, like five to 10 kilometers. The last one was discovered in 2001. Since then, even with much bigger uh, technology and much better technology, uh, we, you know, the inventory is done. I mean, we, we, know, we know all of them. And the one kilometer, it's going the same way. Now we have, of course, uh, tricky things, you know. Uh, suppose an asteroid rotates in for 4.000 4. 4. 0, 0, 0, 0 year, okay? So every four years, it will cross the orbit of the Earth and we will never see it, right? If it's uh, 3.99 3 year after year, so it may be that in the future we will still discover this type of asteroid. I mean, people doing variable stars observation of the same thing. If the variable star is a multiple of 24 uh, hours of period, you always observe the same part of the, <coughs> of the curve. So there are like some strange uh, selection effects, but on average, we can say that the job is mostly done. Okay, okay and the amateur astronomers. Oh, there was really, uh, you know, a surge of... Uh, amateur astronomers uh, discovering asteroids when we started to have the digital cameras. I mean, you, you've heard of SBIG and the ST6 and the STL 11,000 and so on and so on. Many amateur astronomers discovered uh, many asteroids in the 90s. And then the, the, thing, the thing went down because mostly, well, two things, the big surveys who observe, you know, uh, asteroids like 21.5 and you with your C8, you go to 18, 19. So by the time you see it, they have been two months. Uh, it has been recorded two months ago. And there was also a big, big change, which is that uh, the MPC, the Minor Planet Center, changed the rule, which is that now the discoverer is the first one who saw it during the, uh, uh, before it was the, fir the first person with whom you could calculate a decent orbit. And so it made it that, Basically, as an amateur, it, it's almost impossible now to discover a main belt asteroid because uh, you know, usually the, the surveys have the priority. It was quite a frustrating experience for many people who just left the field because they felt their, their work was not uh, recognized. Okay? Uh, in my case, uh, I will explain a bit more, but we, with a friend, we started a survey in, in 2015 with a 16-inch and a 16 megapixel camera, and we really felt we would be able to find things. And after 15 months, we stopped because we had missed, well, we had seen a lot of asteroids and comets, but they were all discovered. So, you know, you, you, you lose your time and, and, and money for, for nothing. Uh, at the time, there were still a few amateur groups who were still observing and discovering a few things, but uh, really, it was very hard to get, uh, you know, a, a lot of discoveries and so on and so on. Um, so we tried to think recently with some friends, you know, how, how could we do that? Okay, how can we grow again, uh, grow again in, this, uh, in this business? So you have the four, four elements, you know, the sky, um, asteroid surveys in Princeton, nah. <laughs> Not good, okay? Uh, where I live, uh, a bad year is when there is only 310 clear nights. Uh, the best year we've had was in 2013. And, uh, well, we don't observe during the full moon because the sky is too bright, but uh, in the observatory I, I, I run, there is a viable star observer, so he observes 
sometimes magnitude eight stars, so full moon or not full moon, he observes all the time. He keeps a track of how many nights. And uh, in 2013, from September 2013 to September 2000, enfin, end of uh, uh, August 2013, he observes 345 nights. I think in the whole year, there were 20 cloudy nights, which is, well, most, not, more, most places when you have 20 cloudy nights in the months, you're doing good. Okay. Uh, so that's very important because then you can cover a lot of sky. And then, of course, silicium, 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 big mirror, uh, big detector, powerful computer. And that was, in fact, the, the problem. Uh, as you know, uh, telescopes, well, <laughs> Yeah, you're observing sight. <laughs> <clears throat> so I salute my wife who accept to live in the desert. Um, the price of the optics goes completely crazy. I mean, uh, as soon as you get out, get out of the 16 inch, then the price go in the 20,000, 30,000 and, and well, much more. Okay. Uh, the detectors is also the same thing. You have the commercial detectors, which are like 4,000, 12,000 maximum. But then if you want to, you know, like the, the STA 1600 that they have at uh, Catalina, it's like $300,000. And so I mean, out of the budget of most normal uh, person, I would say. Uh, and of course, we realize that the computers, computer price goes down. Uh, you know the Moore's law. Uh, every 18 months, the power is doubling and so on and so on. And, and of course, you also realize that uh, MODP, I mean, the, the, the software I told you about, was written first in 1984. 1984 in computer time is like uh, antiquity, okay? Uh, in 40 years, everything has changed and so on. So we tried to see, and it was just like luck that everything fell in place. But, you know, let me talk to you briefly about San Pedro. So triple point between Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile. It's a very touristy place. In fact, it's the most touristic place in Chile. Uh, Alma is like a few kilometers. I mean, the base camp is like visible from my house. Uh, we have a lot of good nights. We start to have more and more uh, light pollution. Uh, in fact, this uh, cloud here is the electricity company, and I'm kind of fighting with them so that they stop uh, wasting energy and polluting. The other thing here is a mine, which is like 70 kilometers uh, away, but they, they, they lit like crazy. Uh, I did put this picture because I like it. Uh, that's uh, my 28-inch telescope with the Milky Way and so on, uh, and the zodiacal light. Uh, and ta -da, a comet. There was a, a comet on the image. It was done by a, a French uh, amateur photographer, uh, Sabine Gloagen. Uh, so the 72 centimeter telescope was the largest we had. Uh, recently, we had the, we, we finished this one, the, the 45 inch uh, telescope. Uh, find the mirror on eBay. Telescope mirror. Okay. Uh, the, the the thing is, uh, it was kind of strange because uh, it was uh, the price was like thirty five thousand dollars, and I went like, yeah, for that it's very 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 cheap. Okay, and uh, the temptation was high. Uh, of course, you had to bid, and this I hate because of course there is always that guy who has a faster internet in the last five seconds, put $5 more and you lose it. So I talked to the, the optician with Norman Fulum uh, in, uh, in Quebec, in fact, in Montreal. And uh, well, no, first I had contacted him because I wanted to buy a bigger mirror. And he was, uh, he told me I can do a, you know, a 60 inch mirror for $150,000. And I was like, uh, too expensive. Okay. And then when I saw that thing, uh, it was a cellular mirror. I had sent him an email I said, have you seen this uh, thing in the eBay? What do you think about it? Say, I think a lot of good, it's, uh, I, I am selling it. Okay, and so finally we bought, I, I bought it for like 45,000. 
And then it took quite a lot of, I, it's not that it took a lot of time, it took a lot of money. And so when we had some money, uh, then I, I worked with a friend who was a mechanical engineer at uh, Paranal, at the ISO DLT telescope. And so when we had some money, I say, oh, do that part, do that part, and so on. Because uh, all the other telescopes I have, I, I built myself uh, because I have like the lathe and uh, milling machine and welding equipment and so on and so on. But these, the parts are too big and too heavy. So it was done in, uh, was done in Santiago. And in the 2019, at the end of in November, it was uh, finished. Like right now, it's a big Dobsonian telescope. Uh, the, the viewfinder, well, I have two of them. I have a 50 millimeter, and that's a six inch refractor on the, on the top. So right now, it is still completely uh, manual, but I'm flying back tomorrow with most of the electronics. And uh, uh, two things. First, uh, the sky is good. The Austral sky is like so much better. I mean, we, we offer different types of tour. The, the semi-private tour is we take about 14 people and then we show them the naked eye sky and they observe you know, the main object. I mean, one well, planet, if there is, the moon, if there is, uh, then a bright star, because people like to see a bright star, you know. Um, globular cluster, diffuse nebula, planetary nebula, galaxy and then, then explain to them how the star evolved and these type of things. Uh, we also do private tours, so sometimes people just buy the tour for themselves. Uh, we also do a tour for uh, amateur astronomers, which we call the bucket list tour, because several people told me ah, it was on my bucket list here to come and so on. So I take people uh, during the first hour of the night and we look in the uh, eastern horizon. Then I do my regular tours. Then at one o'clock they come and we observe like one hour, one hour and a half. Then they go to bed and then I wake them up at five o'clock and we have the western, uh, the eastern horizon. Sorry, I, I goofed. And so this way they can see most of the, the objects plus the one they want and so on and so on. Uh, so right now this telescope is mostly used for, uh, is only used for the, 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 the public viewing. And it really gives uh, very, very nice images. I mean, one of the things we do, for example, we look at Omega Centauri, then we look at 47 Tucan, and then we look at M13. <laughs> <laughs> the great globular, you know. And uh, very often I, I joke, and, but it's a reality, we say, uh, uh, people make a PAD, you know, post Atacama depression. They observe, they see the Milky Way and so on, because of course we have the center of the Milky Way, we have the Tarantula Nebula, which is like completely crazy in that telescope. And then they go back to their city and then look at the sky and don't want to observe more for about six months. Okay. Anyway, we have a, a lot of other activities there. Uh, so this is the view of. Uh, in fact, my house is like uh, there. These are the telescope. Uh, we used to have this picture is before the, the 45 inch was installed. This was, this is the, the 20, 28 inch. Uh, I host several uh, telescopes and we have also lodges where we can receive amateur astronomers who come to, yeah, I'm doing like publicity, okay. Um, <clears throat> we can observe the sky and take pictures and so on. We can rent equipment and so on and so on. Uh, it's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I think. No, we don't see it, but Alma is kind of like here. Well, the base camp, okay. Uh, the antennas are on the other side of the, of the Andes. So anyway, first, first thing first was to have a good site. Okay, uh, I'm coming from France, as you may guess from the accent. Uh, in France, you cannot do good surveys. Okay, uh, plus on average, when you want, you need to observe something that night it's cloudy. Okay, um, the way it works, I mean, the, the average thing is that uh, January, February, we may have like clouds. Some, some years are quite good. Some years we can have like three weeks of clouds. Uh, then March to July should be about good most of the time. Uh, July, August could be a little bit cloudy. Then September, December, we lose three, four, five nights 
and every every night is clear. So that makes a very big difference. Okay. So the first thing was to secure this, and also, of course, all this allowed me to get money to pay the rest. Okay. Uh, then uh, 2014, uh, Celestron uh, came out with a new design of Astrograph, which is really very, very good. Uh, it's only usable in photography and it's very hard to use it. You, know, you cannot put a filter wheel in front of the telescope and so on. But other than that, the, the field is very good. The images are sharp. It's really a very, very you know, improvement compared to like any astrograph that you can, you can use. Um, one of the things that we do when we observe, when we discover an asteroid, I will explain more in the coming slides, uh, we confirm it with another telescope. So at first we used the 16 inch you saw before, and we were not confirming many things. And so we were like, yo, that's weird. Uh, we use a CMOS cameras and CMOS cameras really change a lot. So this slide should have been, I mean, this one should have been first. So this is uh, two of the RASA that we have and two of the C14 with hyperstars. Um, these are like between, we use them between zero and minus 30 of declination. And this is below uh, minus 30. And so we cover like this quite a lot of, uh, of sky. Uh, now let's see if I can go back. Yes, now we have problems because we are not confirming the faint object. And the reason was the CCD camera was, <laughs> it's really very, very bad. So here uh, you have like our, our standard exposure where we do 36 exposure of 30 seconds. This one is 60 exposure of 30 seconds with a 16 inch, not an 11 inch. And it doesn't go, you know, you see a big difference. And so, of course, uh, the, the, the CMOS cameras have been a, another very important uh, revolution in the, in the work of amateur astronomers. Uh, before, when you wanted to have like a thin back illuminated camera, blah, 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 you were talking $30,000, okay? Well, depending on the size of the chip and so on. Uh, now, the, uh, the chips are made by Sony and uh, there are base, base, basically two vendors who are Chinese. Uh, you have the ZO and the QHY, and they really, you know, made a lot of uh, difference. But then, of course, you can record a lot of data. Uh, one series of image that we do is about four gigabyte. Uh, we do a lot of processing, but basically, we we deal to we we deal about three hundred something gigabytes per night of data uh, to to process. But same thing. It has also improved quite a lot. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, we use uh, graphic processing units, uh, which are like, uh, you know, the, the market of computers is driven by the main, uh, the main market is people hunting monsters or I don't know what they do with their computers and then the data miners. And uh, of course, in our case, we use them to uh, improve the, the, the speed of the calculation. Uh, the, the, the current setup is something like this. So we have like the confirmation telescope. We have small NUC PCs, next unit of computing uh, PCs. And uh, basically we process the data a lot. When we take an image, we process the, we pre-process the image that was taken before, you know, if you know about darks and flats, this type of things. We also generate a Bing 2 image because we realize that, uh, uh, you know, the fast moving objects, even in 30 seconds, they leave a trail. And so you put the light on two pixels instead of one. So we, we first run in real time during the night the detection on the, the Bing 2 image. And then in the morning, uh, we run again uh, on all the fields which were done on the Bing 1 image to have like the slow mover, the slow through asteroids. Uh, the software is very simple. Kind of. <laughs> okay, but it, this is really the, the, the real show of the data, the, the way it's done. Uh, the acquisition process, you have the pre-processed image. Uh, you have a scheduler, of course, because when you have several telescopes, you don't want this one to move the telescope when this one is still finishing to read out the image or this, uh, to, to expose the image and so on and so on. 
uh, we use so synthetic tracking. Synthetic tracking is a relatively new, uh, well, you know, the, the image shows you very quickly what it is. Okay. So if you take the, 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 the image and you stack everything with uh, the stellar motion, you don't see the asteroid. And you find, if you find the right speed and the right orientation, then it's like it pops out, it's quite visible. So here, of course, it's a very simplified version. We do in the bin two image, we do 30,000 uh, shift and add if you want. So you have different vectors and you have different lengths. Uh, and then when the software detects something which is a point like source, then it, it tracks us. Okay. Uh, now this software was invented by two different groups, and two different one group and one person. Uh, at the JPL, uh, they got you know, hold of a fast readout uh, camera and they realized that they could start to do these things with the GPU boards and so on. The GPU boards basically improve the speed of your PC by a factor of 100, okay? Uh, and then an amateur astronomer, Daniel Parrot, wanted to use a remote telescope to find asteroids except he could not do like one, two, three, four, five, and one, two, three, four, five, etc. So he had to stay on the field for one hour. And then he realized that like he, if he stacked the image, he would see a lot more, uh, a lot more stars. And then if he was moving with the average speed of the main belt asteroid, he would detect a lot of asteroids. And then he understood uh, the trick is, and the, the thing is, uh, Daniel is a, uh, relatively young guy, he must be 30 years old. Uh, he works at Oklahoma, Oklahoma City uh, Airport and uh, his main occupation is to improve the detection of radar, uh, detection of airplanes. So it's quite a lot to do the, 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 about the same type of rhyme as the asteroids. And so uh, he independently uh, discovered and uh, you know, invented this, uh, this technique uh, which really, uh, you know, helps a lot because, of course, first you do the detection on the total exposure time, because otherwise, if you do four images of each field, uh, you only detect on the, the exposure time of one single exposure, not the four. Uh, and then you don't care about the trailing of the asteroids, and it's really, uh, you know, a much better t detection. Hello, I've wrote all the. Uh, software in order to automatize the observation. So the thing uh, as a list of fields it has done, and so it's not redoing things that have been done in the last four or five nights or something like this. It avoids the Milky Way, it, avo it avoids the moon as well. And so the thing runs alone. Uh, right now uh, we have a younger guy called Florian who has uh, automatized quite a lot of things. So the telescopes are opened automatically. They start to observe alone and so on and so on. I do my tour. At the end of my tour, I go and see if there are some discoveries and so on. And then we have like six hours of difference, uh, sometimes four right now, six hours with France. And then my other friends can wake up and uh, look at the images and see if we have discoveries. Uh, so this is the type of uh, the amount of sky we can run. That was only with the two Raza uh, during, the, during the month. Uh, so Tico is uh, well, commercially available, costs like $50, which for the type of software is really a very, very small price. Uh, it detects the objects, the asteroids. It tells you if the object is known or unknown. There's a file from the Minor Planet Center, which is called mpcorb.dat, which are like 1.2 million of asteroids. So if the object is known, we don't even look at it, basically. If it's unknown, you have at least three solutions. One, it's really unknown. Okay, you, we, we are the discoverers. Two, it, is, it just has been discovered by some other group and it's still on what we call the near subject confirmation page. Uh, it can be a fake asteroid, uh, mainly around very bright stars and you have reflections where the, the software will detect aligned things which do not exist. And the fourth thing is, of course, the slow moving satellites. So it's about the fifth time we discovered the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, the first time we had like a 15th, uh, 15th magnitude asteroid and unknown, it was like, wow, you know, you know. And 
<clears throat> but uh, there is a website where you can put your uh, astronomic observation. It tells you what satellite it is and uh, James Webb. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, uh, well, we shouldn't say that, but we call it the JWFST. Fucking space telescope. <laughs> 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 well, anyway, uh, but uh, there is a spectra thing. Uh, there is a Russian satellite we have detected many times. There is all, I don't remember the name. There is also a cluster of four satellites which make a, kind of like a very small thousand cross. So, you know, you, you, with the experience, you see, yeah, that thing is too bright to not have been detected, and so you double check. But you can also find objects which are very bright because if the Earth is there and the object comes from the sun side, uh, nobody has observed it, and it crosses the sky, and you can detect it, detect, detect it quite bright. Uh, one of the things is uh, we are, I mean, apart from all this software, the confirmation telescope is very important. When you have a very fast moving object, like 20 arc seconds per minute, so you're Jupiter in two minutes, so you can almost you know, you see it moving in real time. You find the object at minus 50 degrees of declination. The following night, it's at plus 50 declination. And so you want to follow these objects several times during the night. Otherwise, the following day, you can consider it's lost. Uh, that's one of the things, you know, the LSST will do this type of thing. They will do a third of the sky every night. And then four nights later, they will try to recover the object. I mean, most of them, they will not be. Uh, I mean, the good thing about the LSST, it will be so powerful, it will detect the, the nearest object in the main belt. Uh, but it, I don't think it will be very efficient for the fast moving uh, uh, asteroids we, 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 we detect. Alors, we have, uh, <clears throat> at first, the Tico tracker software was relatively uh, simple, and we asked Daniel to improve this, improve that, and so on, but we made a lot of things around it. Uh, so we first, well, we recovered the, the data uh, given by, uh, by Tico tracker. It gives, you, it gives us this type of image and gives you the speed of the object and blah, blah, blah. The first, you can see if the object is as a, you know, looks honest or not, if it's a fake asteroid or not. Well, you can see several things. Uh, way above, uh, the, the NPC has a software called uh, the NPC check. You, know, you, can, you can send the observation and it tells you the probability that the object is a nearest object or not. Uh, you see it can be a uh, nearest object, uh, and then uh, this, yeah, this one was like, uh, you know, it was very fast, nine, nine arc seconds per minute. This one was 100% sure it was a nearest object. There is another software which we implemented in there called the uh, Find Orb, which gives, you, uh, gives us an approximation of the semi major axis, the eccentricity, and the inclination. And of course, uh, the, the, the measurements that were produced by Tico. Uh, we can also visualize in a median form that, that helps us uh, removing the stars and because sometimes we have like three mages, but one of them is in a bright star. So with this type of uh, visualization, we remove the, the background basically. Uh, what else have we got here? Uh, we are, of course, if the object looks like unknown, uh, we click on this button and it generates the, the email to send to the Minor Planet Center. Uh, we have, well, the MPC check because our version of the MPC check is not the one they use. If the object has a 67% chance of being a nearest object, you can send it. Uh, below that, you will not take it. Uh, then it will give you uh, first the, the, the rating, okay? And it gives you the possible objects. So you see here, we, we have one 2022K or K O S K S, K zero S, no, K, K O five, sorry, that's a five. Uh, magnitude 20.1, that looks like magnitude 20. Uh, it's like quite <coughs> far, okay? Now what happened is that uh, the nearest object very often make a short apparition because they go like this and you lose them in, in a week. Uh, if an object like that has been followed one week, but 10 years ago, uh, the orbit is not very good and the object can be quite off from the position. 
So what we do, uh, we have another button, which is like uh, get ops, and we recover all the observation from this object, we put ours, and then we use find orb, and uh, it tells you uh, if the object, uh, alors, these are all the observations that were made up to here, plus ours, okay? And uh, you run find orb, and it tells you that it matches pretty well, okay? You see the residuals are, not very good for this one, but it's a faint object, so it's so we know we you know we have recovered this object. Okay. Or sometimes we, we send it, sometimes we don't have the time, we, we don't. And of course, find orb gives you all the orbital elements. Uh, you know a little bit about orbital elements, the semi-major axis, the uh, eccentricity, the inclination, the longitude of the perihelion, the longitude of the ascending node. Then when you have these five numbers, you have to give a position in the orbit. So sometimes, we, very often, we give the, da the date at which the object is at the perihelion. So with six numbers, we define completely the, the, the orbit, okay? Uh, there is, a, in fact, if you click, alors, if you click on this, it gives you also another very important value, which is called the moid, minimum orbital intersection distance. So you have the two orbits like that, the moid is this distance how close the two orbits from the Earth and the object can be, okay? So you see, the way, so there is quite a lot of software in order to have the, the, the thing working. And of course, what we do, and that's a mistake. Now let's see, yes, we can send a confirmation and that goes automatically to the 50 centimeter telescope, which will observe, reduce the data and of course confirm or not the object because sometimes you have objects which really look like an asteroid i mean 17 18 19th magnitude it's you know visible you you see the object it, it looks like a star there is no problem 20 20.5 20 it gets like very faint you, so then the confirmation tells you i mean if the 50 centimeter finds it the, the object is real if you cannot confirm it then you know it was just a fake fake detection. But anyway, just to explain that we created quite a lot of software uh, for the, the whole thing uh, to work. Uh, now, the results is that uh, in two years and something, two years and a third or something, we have discovered 150 uh, uh, NEOs, uh, five comets, uh, five uh, are con oh, no. okay. potentially as hard as asteroid or perfectly harmless asteroids. <laughs> so your choice, okay? Uh, in fact, there are very, very few, there are, I think like 10, 20 or something like that, asteroids which really cross the orbit of the Earth, okay? But in order to have an impact, the Earth would, be, would have to be at the wrong place and the asteroid at the wrong place at the same time. It's very unlikely, okay? Uh, as you know, I mean, when the last time you heard of a, a big catastrophe with, a, you know, like we have in the stupid movies, in, uh, not stupid, but anyway, uh, interesting different movies like Armageddon, Deep Impact, and so on and so on. The probability that there is during our lifetime an impact is really very, very, very low, uh, but it sells very well. Okay. Now, one of the positive things is that a lot of amateurs are now using GPU boards and the Tico tracker software and uh, start to discover objects and so on. But you have to be very persistent. And in my case, it's good because I have the tours. The tours take three hours of my day and the rest of the time I can do other things. Uh, when the program is running, basically I watch like every hour or so to see if there is something. Uh, then if there is something, I do a few click, 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 and the object is sent to the to the MPC. The confirmation is made. So not a lot of work, okay? Uh, but of course, it's because we have a pretty good team. I mean, uh, Daniel is like very, very bright at computing. Uh, George Attar uh, used to have, where well, he worked mostly for a company doing missiles and stuff. He had a team of about 150 engineers below his, uh, uh, under his command and so on. And one of the, I mean, you have to understand, they are amateurs, but they are very good professionals in their domain, okay? 
uh, very often when you talk about amateurs, you go like, yeah, amateurs. <laughs> In fact, these guys are much better than most of the engineers I, I knew when I was uh, working for scientific research. Uh, and the reason for which they were not working in scientific research is because they were better paid in other fields. You know, never get too rich becoming an astronomer, as some of you know. Uh, and so, yeah, there was that 2023 DW, which was like at one moment. I mean, we discovered that thing. Let me, yeah, here. Uh, looks like another discovery, you know, quite bright, no problem, and so on. Uh, the trails, like, do, 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 is uh, because we do some dithering between the series of images. Every three images, we move a little bit the telescope so that the, the hot spots are not in the same place and so on. Okay. Um, we discovered it, we followed it during the same night. It was followed by other people, we recovered it as well, and so on and so on. Once it gets uh, circular, that means once the MPC, uh, I mean, in our case, it was called, it's even impossible to read, uh, but anyway, we have a, like an internal code. Then when the circular comes out, basically, uh, we move to other things. But then more people observe, and then there are two software, one at the NASA JPL and then at the European Space Agency, when they calculate the close approach to the Earth. Uh, one of the things, of course, when you measure something in the sky, uh, you measure to, at best, a tenth of an arc second. Sometimes if the object is faint, it's more like half, a, half an arc second. But half an arc second at the distance of the object is, can be like 100 kilometers. And so you have like for your 50 meter block uh, asteroid in a 100 kilometer zone. Okay. And what happened is that these objects, like uh, very often, they come close to the Earth or Mars or Venus. And of course, you have this zone where the asteroid could be. It gets closer to the Earth. If it's here, it's going to be diverted one way. If it's there, the Earth has moved. It will be diverted in another way. The result is that when an asteroid comes, comes like this close to the Earth or close to another planet, this incertitude zone kind of like explodes completely. And you do three, four approaches on the Earth. Uh, you know, you look at the object 30 years later, and the object can be like within 10 million kilometers. If in the 10 million kilometers the Earth is present, then there is a probability of impact. But the probability of impact is like, uh, you know, in fact, we say one out of 600, one out of three. You know, the probability should be 99.9998 percent that there will be no. But it's ex more, more exciting to say that there is a probability of impact. Okay, uh, that's the evolution of the probability of impact. Uh, the one of the last observation that that was a frustrating thing. You know, you work with your 28 centimeter telescope and so on, and you know the object was going to be magnitude 21, 22, 23, and you will not be able to follow it. So I send an email to a friend who worked at uh, ESO with the VLT. <laughs> And he told me, yeah, yeah, we have it. Uh, we're going to observe it, but not right now. It's way too bright. <laughs> you know, and uh, they made 15 second exposure. The asteroid was magnitude 23 and oh, you, know, you see it very easily. Uh, it's a lot better to have an eight meter telescope than a 28 centimeter telescope. <laughs> anyway, they follow it long enough. And of course, we ruled out that there would be an impact and so on and so on. And that's one of the things that I really don't like about the whole thing. Um, all the hype for useless reasons, okay? We have, I, I believe you know that we have observed seven, I think, seven asteroids, which in the following days fell on the Earth. Uh, one was in Sudan, another one was uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, close to Panama, another one was in Botswana, another one was an island in the... Arctic Sea, some place, and so on and so on. Um, those are like two, three, four, five meter asteroids. And unless you receive the meteorite on your head, I mean, they don't represent any risk. Okay. Um, these asteroids, if you take the volume around the moon, they are like 50 of them at any moment. I mean, a lot of them, we detect only a few of them. Uh, the, the bigger one, like the 50 meter, same thing. I mean, 
the, the thing is going to fall, it's going to make an explosion of 15 megatons, which is like the star bomba. Yeah, but the star bomba didn't kill anybody. In fact, you can detonate a 15 megaton bomb on the Earth in a lot of places, and it will not kill too many people. Some sailors, but you know, life is hard. Uh, but there are, I mean, the, 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 the part of the Earth which is uh, populated is only three persons. Okay, so even uh, when you have like an asteroid uh, which falls on the Earth every hundred year, only one out of, you know, one every 3,000 years it will fall above a city. So the thing in Chelyabinsk was like bad luck, but as I told you, it didn't kill anybody. Uh, we, have, uh, yeah, we have had a lot of discussion about this, you know, the Torino scale. And we were a few people who are really against it. At first, because yeah, it has colors and stuff and probabilities and so on. It looks scientific and so on. In science, you publish your paper only when your data is good. If you know the data is crummy, unless it's like some weird result that needs to be confirmed and so on, 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 on average, you don't publish. Even less so when what you publish is, we're going all to die. Okay, this you should be careful about it. Uh, I believe, I don't know, in the United States, but in France, there was a lot of mess uh, about the COVID, the interpretation, interpretation of the, well, exponential law, explain that to the average person is very hard. Uh, a lot of people said, yeah, but I mean, there are much more people who die with car accidents. Yeah, except that when you have a car accident, you don't take the rest of your car and you kill <laughs> another three, four people who go and you know, it's, you know, it's very hard to explain things like this to the general public. The reality is that it will very likely never be used on a real case. It's just a tool to make some hype and some false information because basically we calculate things uh, in real time. And that's, that's a NASA policy. Uh, as you know, some people live in uh, separate worlds. They have like, some people believe in ghosts, believe in whatever. And most people know that NASA just is a big agency who keep lying to the people and so on. And if they knew, of course, they wouldn't say and that type of thing, okay? Um, so the, the NASA policy is to publish everything. And of course, when you have a three-day arc on an asteroid, you should not publish anything about an impact because very, very likely in the following week, uh, that's what happened with uh, our 2023 DW, uh, in the following week, the probability will go back to zero and there is no news and there was no need to you know, alert all the people and so on and so on. And one of the things, of course, it doesn't take into account the time to impact. That's what I'm saying in the last phrase. Uh, 100 meter asteroid for the next week, you cannot do anything except try to evacuate the rich people <laughs> the rich people will go away because they have their own private jet. Okay, <laughs> you will be at the airport. There will be two thousand other people who will take. You know, so and in, in many countries you cannot evacuate. I mean, evacuate uh, half of India, for example, is completely impossible to do, and so on. Um, if it falls in the middle of Siberia, everything is beautiful. If it falls on the ocean, you can evacuate the people. I mean, most people, mainly in the Pacific region, know about tsunami and know that they have to run and uh, get in some you know, altitude. But uh, yeah, one kilometer asteroid, if we were to detect an asteroid that would fall on the Earth in 50 years, we would take care of it. This thing is not uh, dangerous. Okay, we would have to do things, but in itself, it's much less dangerous than a smaller asteroid where you don't have the time. And so this scale has no, no information about the time. Uh, but anyway, it went through and they were so happy to put the Torino scale and blah, 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 and I was like, pissed off anyway. <laughs> so anyway, that's roughly what I wanted to explain. Uh, thank you for your, for your time. <laughs>
requires typically how many observations over how many days is it generally? Okay. One of the parameter is I lost you. Okay, uncertainty parameter. Okay. Uh, at first, when you have like a half an hour of observation on a four year orbit, you can immediately know that the object is going to fall on the Earth in six months and 14 days. <laughs> You've seen, don't look up. Yeah, that's the type of thing. So you know nothing. <laughs> okay. You can pass. In fact, the MPC calculate like, uh, you know, the Monte Carlo approach. Basically, you have your points, then you make variation and you calculate like 2000 orbits. And the, the numbers are completely wild. Uh, if you observe it during the night, then you can maybe recover it the following day if it's a fast mover. Uh, in order to have some reasonable elements, now the idea is that when you do the follow up in, in the best of the worlds, you would do it in an exponential way. You follow it one night, the other night, then you can let two nights. Then we have the two nights, then you can follow in four nights later, then eight nights later, and so on and so on. You still find it while it's visible. But sometimes it's not because it's the same thing. It can go in during the day and you lose it very, very quickly. Uh, to be numbered, the, this U parameter needs to be uh, zero and needs to have been observed during three oppositions at least. Okay, so it depends really what you want to do with the with the orbit. If the orbit, if the element, the orbital elements, now what they do with this Monte Carlo thing, they can predict in the NEOCP page. You can do a map and the project with the 2,000 orbits where the object is going to be, like tomorrow, for example. And you have a cloud, okay, and uh, when the cloud uh, gets right, when your measurements improve, 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 this cloud gets smaller, smaller. When, with it, when it's like within one arc second the following day, they publish the circular, okay? But uh, 10 years later with the same element, orbital elements, very likely you will not recognize it at first, okay? And there are people who spend their time playing with orbits and see if they match and so on and so on. And sometimes they can link objects which have not been observed for 10 years or these type of things. So it really depends on what you want to do. To be numbered, U needs to be zero, and that guarantees you that in the next 20 years, you will find it within a few arc seconds of where it's supposed to be. Okay. So, you, so on the presentation, like on the last slide, it said that um, in, the event, in the event of natural collisions of the many O with Earth, um, I don't understand the question. Speak louder. You know, I'm old. One day you will see, you know, it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, on, the, on the last slide, you said that in the event of an actual collision with an near Earth asteroid, um, you, like where it had the Florida scale, mm -hmm. it wouldn't, like it said that they wouldn't use that scale. In, in the event of an actual impact. No, 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 no. They, they would, but most of the time, what they do is, uh, in fact, they just, dis uh, they just discovered that this asteroid in 50 years is going to be get close to the Earth. Okay? It's just the fact that our orbit is, I mean, if we could observe the asteroid and immediately get U equal zero and we could uh, see the inclination to like five decimals and so on and so on and so on. You would just see in real time that the object is just going to be one of these close approach. For example, this asteroid, which at first there was a probability that it would hit the Earth. Same thing, 50 meters, not that big, okay? Uh, it's not like the dinosaur killer and so on and so on. Uh, in reality, we know now it's going to be uh, like three millions of kilometers away from the Earth. I mean, you know, so. Every, at every single moment, you have a lot of asteroids close to the Earth, and we calculate this. And to me, it's like not false information, but almost. Uh, it could be, it could be that one day we discover an asteroid, they find, wow, there is a probability of impact. Uh, and then you observe more, 
So this incertitude zone that I talked about will get closer, closer, but if the Earth is still there, the probability gets higher, higher, higher. The one such case was Apophis. Uh, we were lucky on that one, let me tell you. Uh, at one moment, the calculation said there was like 10% collision uh, probability. Turns out it was just during the tsunami in Indonesia, nobody talked about it. That was good. <laughs> because of course it went down to, as we improve the orbit, then the thing gets closer and the Earth is out of it and there is no impact. Okay? But it could be that, yeah, what is the probability we will die from an asteroid in the coming, well, how old are you? Yeah, in the next 100 years, because you will live 113 years, okay? Uh, the probability is extremely, extremely, extremely uh, low. It's important to do the job, okay? Because in fact, it's the only natural catastrophe that we can really predict. Well, you can also predict that if you live close to the ocean, you may have a tsunami. If you live close to volcanoes, you may have a volcano. Uh, if you live uh, in California, in the, the uh, fire circle, uh, circle of fire, or whatever, you will have like uh, uh, earthquakes and so on. In Chile, we have everything. <laughs> <coughs> but I mean, uh, <coughs> the, the volcano, the big volcano in front of my house, the last time it exploded was 17,000 years ago. And I hope it will be nice enough not to explode in the next 30 years. Once I'm dead, you know, I don't care. But uh, the asteroids, yes, you can, uh, you can predict. Uh, but like 99, you know, it's a, the probability that the probability and the impact is correct is very low, okay? Uh, you, you detect an, a close approach and you arrive like uh, it has one chance out of 300. I mean, it has 299 chance out of 300 not hitting the Earth. Okay, and then you improve the orbit, and then you find that it's going just to be going, it's just going to be one of these asteroids that come close to the Earth. Okay, it could be useful, but it's very unlikely. Early on, you were, I thought I got the impression that if you make an observation of an asteroid that is not a unique, it's not a detection, but it's not a discovery, yeah, that you were disappointed. That you that you weren't the first to discover. But in fact, a repeat discovery, a repeat detection, sorry, yeah. like that does help fine tune the orbital element. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but what happened is that, uh, well, let's see, I have it somewhere. <laughs> no, here. Yeah, you see? It tells you uh, NEO, this is an NEO subject, desirable between such date and such date. Uh, sometimes uh, it's like in three weeks, so we don't spend the time. If it's like within, if they say if the, the software tells it's desirable to do the other, then we send it, of course. Okay? But sometimes, for example, we or another group detect an asteroid. We detect it 15 minutes later, but we send the observation before and we get the discovery. So sometimes, you know, you, you feel like, ah, the damn people in Arizona, they beat us again, you know? And sometimes, yeah, we beat them. <laughs> so it's kind of a game also. You know? Well, first, if it is on the NEOCP, there is really a lot of people who follow them. Uh, when you know where the object is going to be, you don't need, we have like 3.3 by 2.2 degrees. Uh, if you have your typical Newtonian with uh, the size of the moon, then you can follow up. And there are a lot of people following up these, uh, these asteroids, okay? Uh, the point is, uh, We cannot know. In fact, for DW, like one week later, there is a friend who told me, "Ah, your asteroid is interesting." Said, okay, which one? We had four, and you know, we had find three in the same night, and uh, you realize that there is a potential danger only 
three, four, five days later. Okay. Uh, and in our case, you know, that's why we didn't pay attention. We had sent it. It was an Athena asteroid. Life is beautiful. Uh, let's go on with other things. And then uh, later, when they have enough of an orbit, they calculate the probability, which turned out to be zero in the end. Okay. Um, sometimes you find, for example, in uh, the 2nd of January 2022, we discovered an asteroid. It was moving 12 arc seconds per minute. Okay, so looks correct. I sent it directly to the MPC. I sent the confirmation. I got the confirmation, but it was moving eight arc seconds per minute. And it was like, it cannot be, you know, the asteroid is supposed to have a constant speed. Turns out that asteroid, the 1st of January, had passed like 70,000 kilometers from the Earth. And then we got it as it was going away and slowing down. It's slowing down very, very fast. Uh, more recently, uh, like November or something, we find an asteroid. Uh, we calculate a rough orbit like that just to get an idea, okay? Uh, and then we calculate an ephemeris, and we saw that uh, it could, the following day was going to be 220,000 kilometers from the Earth, which is like two thirds or so of the distance of the, the, the Earth to the Moon. And so we made some observations, then we recalculated and we came to 150,000 kilometers. Okay, we made another observation, it was 110. We said, wow, this one is getting very close. But in fact, no, it passed about 110,000 kilometers. Uh, we discover an object and then a big object anyway, that will arrive and fall and uh, make a very big catastrophe uh, instantly. Uh, one of the things is, uh, you know, I told you the one meter, one kilometer objects, you can detect them very, very far away. Sometimes uh, we detect five meter asteroids, like 25 millions of kilometers from the Earth. I mean, you know, we're, we're detecting really, really faint things very, very far away. So a one kilometer asteroid, uh, I bad luck arriving mm -hmm. at, you know, no, that's one of the weird things. If an asteroid comes toward you, it has no motion. Mm -hmm. okay. sure. but it has a motion because uh, during the night you move, there is, there is some parallax. Uh, but the, the fast mover normally goes like that. If an asteroid goes just like this, uh, we may not detect it. In fact. And the idea is really to make an inventory, see which one are dangerous, follow them, and so on and so on. Not really detect in real time and so on. So we have detected some asteroids in real time, but they were very small ones. Like a few thousand or one kilometer. Mm -hmm. So statistically, indeed, the fact that you can detect them before the impact and so on, the probability that you detect a one kilometer and it's the end of the world is very, 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 very low. I have an online question. What is the fastest documenting speed of an asteroid or meteorite? Uh, shooting star? Well, meteorite would be a shooting star, but an asteroid would be. Yeah. <laughs> well, it depends saying. on the distance. In our case, uh, the, our software is uh, limited to about 20 or so uh, arc minutes. If we had more computing power, okay, uh, we could do five second exposures and then go after the very, very fast mover. Uh, but uh, I told you some objects you detect at minus 50 degrees and following day they are like, and they move like uh, the motion of the moon in one minute mm -hmm. when they go like very, very close to the earth. And, uh, and that's one of the problems because of course, as they are close to the earth, they, they change their orbit. We, we don't know exactly how, by how much. It's always very hard to follow and to track the object because uh, the, the, the orbital elements that you have are not the one it's going to have when it leaves and it's changing in real time and you don't know how. So you know, that's one of the problems. Yeah. Thank you. Are the Starlink satellites affecting your work? I don't know. Yes and no. <laughs> yes, uh, because very often we have trails and in the trail we find some false detections. Okay. Uh, no. Because we, I mean, they are mostly like in the west or in the east in the morning. But we start to have, I mean, I spend most of my nights uh, outside. 
we start to have like very, very big flashes. So I don't and they have like huge things. But uh, one week before coming, I saw like a magnitude eight, minus eight flash. Wow. You know, yeah. very, very, very bright. Uh, and uh, of course, if you have a comet to photograph in this zone, that's going to be difficult. But in our case, in order to gain a few tenths of a magnitude, we mostly shoot on the meridian. Uh, we are very likely going to change this because uh, if and when LSST start to work, uh, of course, then we go like magnitude 23 in no time. We do. But very big telescope cannot go very low okay, because the optics uh, sag and so on. Uh, so we are thinking of uh, covering more like the, you know, in the morning and in the evening to, to look for some comets coming out of the sun and things like this. Uh, and then it's going to be a problem because uh, apparently, I mean, the current starlings are like 300 kilograms, but the next one is our 1.2 tons. And so those will be a lot brighter, but who cares? <laughs> So could you please clear up something I've been confused on, and maybe others share this, when we had Abby Loeb talk about Oumuamua, and the trajectory of that object appeared to come at a very sharp angle to the plane of the solar yeah. system. So my question is, how rare is it for an asteroid from our planetary system to arrive at, from an angle out of the plane of the solar system, and do you ever see such? You know, Elis Comet. Elis Comet with, uh, is, has an inclination much higher than, you know, if, if you have the inclination of the object, for things like that, you are say it's clockwise for you people who's digital watch. And then you will find it, you will find it, you know, when it's above 90 degrees, it rotates the wrong way. That's, That's in exactly. a way how Elis Comet was discovered. Uh, Haley tried to calculate some orbital elements and so on and so on, except at the time the, 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 the comet went through Orion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so would you okay. say this? Comets here yeah, which had been observed, there were three that were rotating the wrong way. And then you realize that between the first one and the second one, there were 76 years. And second and third also seven, around 76 years. And he, he postulated that was the same object coming back. So we find, of course, comets uh, like this. Okay, we also find some asteroids, except we believe they are dead comets, dried out comets. Okay, but it it happens, yes. And, and of course, in this case, the the software tells you that it's very likely a near Earth object or an interesting asteroid, and so on. And uh, when you see the the orbits from the NEOCP. Uh, you see like the period is 300 years and yeah, you got yourself a comment Then you kind of look to see because we detect we detect now quite a lot of objects which are clearly with a cometary orbit i mean asteroids are like 30 degrees okay more or less okay zero 30 etc uh, above we believe it's more likely a dried out comet and when the orbit is like that it looks like an asteroid it has no tail then it's classified as A slash, and then the number. Uh, it's like a cometary designation saying it's an asteroid. Okay. okay. A couple of times you mentioned sort of racing against other teams to make an observation and send it in mm -hmm. to the first person. At any given point in time, how many new undiscovered objects are there and when one is found, how many people tend to be looking at it? Now, in our case, we only observe below zero degrees of declination because in the north, you have a lot of people, you know. Uh, so we feel, we feel we make a better job going in the south where there are basically Atlas and us. Uh, Pan Star can go to about minus 30 degrees of declination. And of course, with a 1.8 meter telescope, they see us already 22, no problems. And so very often during the night, they can report like 13, 15 new NEOs. And so in our case, well, you know, if they find an asteroid magnitude 21.5, good for them. It, it, you know, it's just like 
you know, the, <laughs> the game, if you want, you know, it, it's like a hunt. Uh, part of it is a, uh, keeps the motivation uh, and so on. Of course, when somebody finds an asteroid, like, and we report it 15 minutes before us, we feel like, you know. <laughs> but uh, sometimes it has been detected like uh, two days, three days before. Uh, what happened is that the, the NPC orb that, that, that file is updated every new, every full moon. Okay. And so all the asteroids that were found during the last months are not on there. So for us, they appear as unknown. Uh, sometimes know, you send the object, uh, then it's not published on the NAOCP, so you wonder what's going on. Now, there is a, a page which is called the WAMO page. WAMO, where are my observations? And so you go to the MPC page, you enter your thing, and it tells you uh, this is such and such which had been discovered like two, two days before, etc. Et <coughs> uh, of course, I mean, you know, it's like the game, uh, but uh, the main thing is that the objects are not lost. Okay. What, what we have had is like a fast moving object. We detected at the end of the night. We could not confirm it. Okay. Then it was lost. And then uh, two weeks later, Catalina observed in the north and find it, and then they realized it was our object. And so we got the discovery, but for us, it was like, oh, yeah, okay, the object is dead, we, are, we, we lost it, and so on. Right, it's you know, part of the game. Anyway. I think we're gonna have to call it a night, and these have been great questions, great answers, and a fantastic talk. We thank you for joining us here. Thank at you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh,